Welcome to our evening service for March the 29th. We're going to get into the scripture here in just a moment. We're going to be in 2 Chronicles chapter 7. Very, very few people will not be familiar with this passage, but we want to look at these promises that God gave for His people, make some application to our own lives. And as we begin, I just want to say how thankful I am for our church family thankful for the faithfulness of God's people, thankful that even in this um, very unique time in our culture, in our community, in our homes, that uh, people are seeking the Lord and making the most of it, we're encouraged by that. I'm going to begin reading in 2 Chronicles chapter 7 and verse 12, if you'll join me there, hope you have your Bible with you and following along in the scripture. The Bible says in verse 12, and the Lord appeared to Solomon by night and said unto him, I have heard thy prayer and have chosen this place to myself for an house of sacrifice. If I shut up heaven that there be no rain or if I command the locust to devour the land or if I send pestilence among my people. If my people, which are called by my name, shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then will I hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and will heal their land. It's interesting in verse 12 and 13, when the Lord spoke to Solomon, he said, if I shut up heaven that there be no rain. In other words, God is the one that would stop the rain from coming. Or if I command the locust to devour the land, God would be um, responsible. God could do that. God can do that. And he says in verse 13, if I send pestilence among my people... And all these were forms of judgment that God would send. But then the promise in verse 14 that God would, if his people would meet these conditions and requirements, that he would heal their land. I want us to look at that together today and trust the Lord to speak to us and encourage us about our personal responsibility in this day in which we live. And let's pray together. Father, we thank you for the opportunity again to open up the Bible, to study the Word of God together. We pray for your help. We ask you, Lord, to speak to us through your Word. We pray, Lord, for our church family and for those who are joining us, Lord, for these online services. We pray, Father, for your Spirit to work in our lives and to speak to us. We're reminded of many people today that we don't know and some that we do know that are in desperate need of your help for medical issues, those who are affected by this virus. We want to pray today for those who are in foreign countries, unable to get home, for those missionaries that we love and support around the world, who have special needs and challenges associated with this time. We pray for them, for your grace to be upon them. We pray today, Lord, for the uh, people who are uh, serving in the uh, health care facilities around the country, around the world, some that we know, some for our ch- from our church, that are on the front lines trying to fight these diseases and help people. Would you especially protect and help them today? And we pray again for your help as we study the Bible. Trust you to use it in all of our lives. In Jesus' name, amen. I want to begin uh, today by just looking at this passage in the context in which it's given, it was a promise to Israel. The occasion in Second Chronicles was the dedication of the temple, the temple that uh, David himself uh, wanted to build. It was in his heart to build. But his son Solomon uh, was the king when this temple was built and dedicated. And so it's a, such an important moment in his in, in Israeli history, the furniture was in place, the, the temple is built, constructed, uh, sheep and oxen are being sacrificed on the altar, uh, 
Uh, the Ark of the Covenant, that most sacred piece of furniture in the, in the temple, was brought into the holy place. Then singers and musicians began to praise and thank the Lord. The Bible says at that time that the glory of the Lord filled the house. Then Solomon the king knelt, lifted up his hands, and began to pray. He prayed that God would be attentive to future prayers that were offered from that most holy place, the temple. And he prayed that if Israel, for instance, was being defeated by their enemies, or if they were in a drought, there was no rain, or if there was pestilence, sickness, that they could seek God's face and God would come and help them and heal them. Look back, if you would, please, to chapter 6, 2 Chronicles chapter 6. And I want to read a few verses beginning with verse 36. This is a part of this prayer uh, that's being prayed. Verse 36 of chapter 6 says, If they sin against thee, for there is no man which sinneth not, and thou be angry with them, and deliver them over before their enemies, and they carry them away captives unto a land far off or near. Talking about if these things happen, Solomon prays. Yet if they bethink themselves in the land whither they are carried captive, if they begin to think it through, remember where in the place that they're captive, and verse 37 says, turn and pray unto thee in the land of their captivity, saying, we have sinned, we have done amiss, and have dealt wickedly. If they, if they begin to confess their sin and acknowledge in humility what they have done wrong, verse 38, and if they return to thee, notice this language, with all their heart and with all their soul, in the land of their captivity, whether they've carried them captives and pray toward their land, which thou gavest unto their fathers, and toward the city which thou hast chosen, and toward the house which I've built for thy name, then hear thou from the heavens. Speaking to God, Solomon says, hear from heaven, even from thy dwelling place, their prayer and their supplications, and maintain their cause, and forgive thy people which have sinned against thee. Then the people, after this prayer of Solomon, the things that have taken place, they, they begin to offer these thousands, we're not going to read about this, but these thousands of sacrifices to the Lord. And as a result of the things that I've just briefly described that of course took place over a period of time, as re then after those things have been said, it says in verse, in chapter 7 and verse 12, that's the text we began with, that the Lord appeared to Solomon by night. God is going to answer the prayers of Solomon. He came to him personally by night, and he gave Solomon these great promises. It, it was a promise for times of national calamity. It was a promise specifically to God's people. It was a promise of forgiveness, of mercy, of spiritual healing. I, I repeat, this was a promise to Israel. And I recognize that, and we recognize that. It wasn't a promise, a blanket promise to all people everywhere. It was a specific promise for Israel. But I also say today that I'm con convinced that it's not unlike other promises that God has given to his people who turn to him with all their heart. Promises of revival, promises of forgiveness, promises of God's hand of blessing, promises of mercy. Throughout the scripture, throughout the Bible, God offers hope and forgiveness for those who turn to God in true repentance and faith. And I'm thinking about this passage and the promise to Israel, but obviously I'm thinking about the place that we live and the time that we live. And I just want to say emphatically today that our land needs healing. 
We need healing, not just for our community, not just for our families, not just for our country, not just for our church, but for our world. This place that we live, the community where we live, needs a spiritual awakening. And with all that we're doing during this coronavirus a pandemic, with all that we're doing to emphasize the need of washing our hands, a social distancing, being careful about those that we're around, not going into places when we're ill, not going into places and around people who are ill, all the things we're doing to stop this virus, I'll question today, and I encourage us all to think about this, what is being done to encourage people to seek the Lord, to seek His face, to seek His help. I read an interesting quote. It's been circulated through social media now for a week or so. I just want to read it as I, as I saw it uh, on the Internet, and I quote, In just a short amount of time, just like God did with the plagues of Egypt, God has taken away everything we worship. God said, this is speaking, of course, um, kind of in um, tongue-in-cheek, maybe, perhaps we would say, because we know God didn't actually say this, but as if God said. God said, you want to worship athletes? I'll shut down the stadiums. You want to worship musicians? I'll shut down civic centers. You want to worship actors? I'll shut down theaters. You don't want children to pray in school? I'll shut them down. You want to worship money? I'll shut down the economy and collapse the stock market. You don't want to go to church and worship me? I'll make it where you can't go to church. Now I realize that God didn't actually say those things, but the point that the writer, whoever began uh, this um, quote that's been circulating through social media, the point he's trying to make is, you know, America's, Americans and people around the world have been guilty of worshiping money, of worshiping uh, theater and entertainment, of worshiping sports and athletic events, putting all those things before God. And the point he's making is, you know, we ought to be thinking not just about how can, we, how can we rid our world from this virus, but how can we fix other things that are wrong in our world? You know, we're all feeling the effects of this medical situation. But we need to remember today that God is the source of our help. I was thinking today of the words of the psalmist in Psalm 121 when he says, I will lift up mine hands unto the hills from which cometh my help. My help cometh from the Lord, which made heaven and earth. Our world is hurting in a great way today. From what I understand, about 170 countries have confirmed cases of this virus. And that's a serious matter. But our world is infected with another disease, a spiritual disease that affects every person in every country. And it's the sickness of sin. This was true in Solomon's day when he wrote these words. There was, the occasion was the uh, dedication of the temple, a very festive, celebrated moment. But Solomon's mind was going to times when there would be difficulties and national calamities and problems. And so in his writing, in his prayer, and in, and in his promise also, there are a, a variety of maladies that are listed, including devastating sickness. It's one of the things that is mentioned. And his as Solomon brought this issue in prayer before the Lord, Solomon recognized that the solution, the healing, 
from these sicknesses was not just removing the physical hardships. The solution was found in dealing with the spiritual problems in Israel. I hope you can make the connection today. The solution was not just in finding the, the antidote for this, for this illness. The solution was also found in seeking God. And so as I think about this passage today, I'm thinking about our world. Yes, it was a promise to Israel, but our land also needs healing. And we need to pray for that kind of healing. We need to look to the Lord. I'm not saying we ought to disregard uh, some of the guidelines that are given to us. I think we ought to respect them. I think they will help stop the spread of this virus. We respect them. We are complying with those guidelines. But we ought to also be seeking the Lord. We ought to also be praying, especially as God's people. Now, as we look at this passage, this very familiar passage in 2 Chronicles chapter 7, we want to just look at and briefly encourage ourselves with the conditions that God laid out for the healing of the land in Solomon's day for the nation of Israel. The first thing that stands out to me is this specific promise was given to a specific people. It was addressed to God's people. Notice in verse 14 where it says, If my people, which are called by my name. This was a promise to God's people. Spiritual awakening if it comes to a community, if it comes to a church, if it comes to a land, spiritual awakening will begin with God's people. If you've ever studied about revivals that have impacted regions of people, where did it start? It started with God's people. And if you look at the conditions, the moral climate in many of these places where God did unusual works of grace in the, in the lives of communities, the, the, the moral temperature was, was horrible. I mean, sin was rampant, disobedience was rampant, people were not respecting God. It wasn't like all of a sudden the culture, the community, uh, the society got so, so close to God and they all began to get their lives in order and then God brought revival. No, it, it starts in places where we would think would be least likely to see God move or to see God work. But where did it actually begin? Inevitably, it began with God's people. And I just want to say to those of us who know the Lord, those of us who have a personal relationship with God through His Son, Jesus Christ, that we need to take this opportunity to draw close to God, especially in these days of social distancing and uh, quarantining ourselves. We need to draw close to God. You know, you don't have to be in church to draw close to God. We can draw close to God wherever we choose to fulfill God's requirements, His expectations, His guidelines, and to seek His face. Uh, we don't have to have, the, and we don't have, we don't have, you and I, we don't have the medical cure for the coronavirus. But we do have access to God who can give guidance, who can give wisdom, and who can cure our spiritual illnesses, our spiritual sicknesses. So this is addressed to God's people. It's addressed to those who know the Lord. And let's just look at the things specifically that God promised uh, to Solomon and the conditions upon these, which this promise is based. Verse 14 again, If my people, which are called by my name, shall humble themselves and pray, and seek my face, and turn from their wicked ways. So the first thing he says to them is if they would humble themselves. Now, let's just think about that. 
Because God is addressing His people, people who should be close to God, people should, who should be dependent upon God, people who should be trusting in the Lord. And He says, if you're going to get my help, you're going to have to humble yourselves. And I want to say to us today, and I put myself in this category, we need to humble ourselves. Pride is such a problem for all of us. It is a part of our fallen nature. It is a part of our sinful nature to believe that we can manage without God. And we have watched in our lifetimes, many of us, those of us who've been around for a few years, we've watched where our society, our culture, our country has become less and less as a whole dependent upon God. We need God. We don't just need God because we have a coronavirus um, pandemic. We don't just need God because there is the uh, obvious reality that just by visiting the grocery store or going shopping or whatever the case might be that we could, we could contract this uh, disease. We don't just need God because the stock market has been crashing or because uh, items that we need from the store are in, sh are in great demand and often in short supply. We need God because He made us to need Him. He made us to be dependent upon Him. He made us that we might trust Him. And it's in, innate, it's in our lives. It's a part of our DNA as fallen creatures not to trust in God the way we should. We need His help. We need His wisdom. We need His grace. You know, if we're thinking about things that we ought to be aware of and repenting of in this time in which we live, one of the first things we ought to think about is our sin of self-reliance, our lack of humility. It is a fact of life that we can go through hours and even go through days, especially when things are going well, when there's no great pressing need. Our Families are healthy. Our job situation seems to be secure. We are um, going through a stage, and we do go through these stages, when it just seems like everything is working for us. And in those times, we have a tendency not to depend on God like we should. We have a tendency not to trust God like we should. We have a tendency, um, as we're warned in Proverbs, we have this tendency to rely upon our own understanding. Not to have this desperate need for God. Not to feel this. Not to get up in our days and our mornings to seek the Lord and to ask for His help and rely upon Him and die to self. God says, if you want me, when things are falling apart in your world, He said this to Israel. If you want me to be there for you, then he says, you need to humble yourselves. You need to acknowledge the pride in your own heart. And I just want to encourage our church family today and those who are joining us online. As we think about seeking God, relying upon God, trusting God, to work in these days, let's start by examining our own heart. How much of that element of pride is present in our own lives? <coughs> pride can manifest itself in many ways. Pride can manifest itself in us not be, being willing to admit where we're wrong or to think that we're better than other people. Pride can manifest itself in any age, in any place. It's very common. So the first thing 
that God said to, to Solomon here is that you're going to have to humble yourself. The second thing he mentions, and I'm going to combine two things in one in verse 14. He says, you shall humble, himself, humble themselves and pray and seek my face. Praying and seeking his face are not necessarily the same thing, but they're similar. Prayer is reaching out to God. Prayer is talking to God. Seeking his face is wanting his attention. It's wanting his blessing. It's wanting his favor. It's focusing on God. Not focusing on ourselves. Not focusing on our entertainment, our world. I, I can't help but feel like before this great um, change came in our world and in our country, people just going about business as usual, going, to their routine, going through their routine, you know, no real pressing needs, making sure we don't miss choir practice or, or, or making sure we don't miss um, our... Um, Appointments, making sure that we get all our kids to their to their music lessons, just making sure that we're you know a church on time, and just but not really any pressing needs, just going through the motions, but without this attitude of desperation. And maybe I'm wrong. Maybe I'm maybe I'm off on this today, but I don't think you have to have a coronavirus pandemic to be desperate about our need for God. I, I don't think that's, I think we can still have a heart for God and a sense of desperation of how much we need Him, even when things are going well. But our focus becomes, if we're not careful, becomes on everything else, our entertainment, our portfolio, our family gatherings, and there's nothing wrong with any of those things, but... We need to look to God. God needs to be first in our life. And, and, and God said to Solomon, I want my people to humble themselves and pray and seek my face. I want to I wanna see my people crying out to me. And I, I do appreciate this. Um, I appreciate the guidance of our national leaders during this time of crisis. And I'm not, this is not a political statement, and I don't agree with everything that our national leaders do or our local leaders do. But I do appreciate um, what seems like a genuine concern for the people and seeking to find common sense solutions, even if they require a major adjustment in our lifestyle to get this thing taken care of. But specifically, I, I heard something that I'm going to just read you a sentence or so that our vice president said uh, in a news conference recently, Vice President Pence, and I'm going to quote, The chorus of prayers coming up from communities across the country is making the difference it always has in the life of this nation. I'm not judging his heart. I don't know where he stands spiritually. But more than once, I've heard our vice president use the phrase that's found here in verse 14 of 2 Chronicles 7, heal our land. And I think the greatest contribution that you and I can make, the greatest contribution we can make for the well-being of our individual lives, for the well-being of our families, for the well-being of our community and country, is to seek the Lord, to pray. God is the answer. I appreciate the fact that our president, a few, what seems like a long time ago, but it's only a couple of weeks ago, called for a national day of prayer. And we, in this building, in Sunday school, in Sunday morning, in Sunday night on that day, cried out to God for God to help us, for God to minister, to, for God to meet needs. And so Solomon asked God, God, if we go through these great times of national crisis, 
would you hear our prayer? Would you be there for us? And, and God said, if my people, which are called by my name, shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face. There are some positive outcomes today that we could pray for. We could pray for the spread of this disease to stop. My wife and I have prayed many times that God in His mercy would stop the spread of this disease. We could pray for healing for those who are affected directly, those who are ill, those who have uh, had this contagious virus. We can pray for grace for the families who are dealing with severe illness or the loss of a loved one. We can pray for other churches, other pastors who are leading their people in ways that they never could have imagined. But also we can pray for spiritual healing. We can pray for people who are lost to be open to the gospel. As my wife and I joined our midweek Bible study this week, and a Bible study that was most of you participated in had to do with trials and difficulties and responding, but the questions at the end, we talked about each of those questions, just the two of us together, and the questions, one of the questions had to do with what could be a positive outcome? What could happen as a result of this that would be good and and one of the things that we've prayed for is that people who are lost would be open to the gospel, that somehow this would open people's hearts and minds to the gospel. But also we could pray for believers to be revived in their spiritual walk. There's a part of this that almost doesn't seem to be reconcilable, and that is In a time when people aren't allowed to get around the church people as much, we're not able to congregate, we're missing the worship services, the singing, the Spirit of God working in our services. In a time when we're not able to get together with small group Bible studies, fellowship, discipleship meetings as we might normally do, that in that setting, that we could actually be growing spiritually. But that's something to pray for. For God to use this, to revive us, to revive us in our love for Him, to revive us in our love for one another, to revive us in our, for our love for the work and, the, and the, the great privilege that one day we will have to assemble again, to worship God, to worship Him with a new appreciation for His goodness. And, and I'm just saying we need to pray for spiritual healing. What a tragedy. It would be if we survived this pandemic and we as a country begin to recover financially and yet if we stayed in the same same place spiritually, it breaks my heart to think that that could happen. That after all the things that we've been through, after all the difficulties, the adjustments that we've been through, the financial loss of many people, people being laid off, people without jobs or having their jobs affected, the sickness, the time of just the fear of the unknown, of all these different things. If we, could, if we would survive this and we're not any better spiritually, what a tragedy that would be. Let's pray for God to work in these days. Let's pray for God's wisdom as we have many, many times prayed for God's wisdom for our leaders. God has instructed us to pray for them. I realize political leaders are going to be criticized, but there's something more that we ought to do for our leaders than to nitpick every decision. We ought to pray for them. We ought to ask God to bless them and give them wisdom. Let's pray for revival. Let's pray for God to do something that we could never do. Wouldn't it be an amazing thing if in a day when our communication with each other is greatly restricted, when we're having to have our preaching and teaching online from a different location where we can't even be there, wouldn't it be, wouldn't it be an amazing thing with these restrictions if God began to move in a great way. Let's pray for revival. You know, this, uh, 
Go, go back to 2 Chronicles 7. I hope you have your Bible still open there. But in 2 Chronicles 7, this is the conclusion of Solomon's prayer. And verse 12 begins with these words. And the Lord appeared to Solomon by night and said unto him, I have heard thy prayer. These promises, the promise of healing the land, the promise of deliverance and help, these promises came as a direct result of Solomon's prayer. God wants us to pray and seek his face. And the final thing I'll notice in verse 14, not only did God say to Solomon, if my people will humble themselves and pray and seek my face, and look with you who would please, right in the middle of verse 14, and turn from their wicked ways. You see, God's people were guilty of sinning. And we, re we read a moment ago where God said in verse 13, If I shut up heaven that there be no rain, if I command the locusts to devour the land, if I send pestilence among my people. He was sending these things because his people were not obeying him. They were guilty of sinning. And he says in verse 14, they're going to have to turn from their wicked ways. You know, it's one thing to point out the sins of others. But it's another thing to be willing to search our own hearts. To search our own lives. To examine our own thoughts and our behavior and our attitudes. And be willing to repent of those things that are not pleasing to God. It would be foolish. It would be hypocritical. It would be in vain to think that God is going to send revival to my heart or to your heart or to a group of people and them not be willing to turn from their wicked ways. If we're going to have revival, beloved, we must deal with our sin. And it's so easy, it's so common, it's so natural to look at people around the country, around the world, and their vile behavior, groups of people, particular sins, and say, why don't they get their life together? Why don't they get right with God? Why do they continue to sin? And yet, there are times when we think that way, or maybe even say those things, and yet we have sin in our own heart. Sin of pride, sin of stubbornness, sin of jealousy. We have sin in our own life, sin of hypocrisy, sin of uh, self-exaltation. We have to deal with our sin. I mean, this is a great promise. God says, I will heal your land. But if I'm going to heal your land, it's going to be because you humble yourself and pray and seek my face and turn from your wicked ways. We don't deserve God's help. I can't pray to God and say, God, heal our land because we deserve it. We ask for God's mercy. We plead for God's mercy. We ask God to be gracious toward us, not to give us what we deserve, but it's, it's vital, it's critical, it's important at all times. But I would say, especially now, that we be willing to examine our own heart. Ask God to show us, Lord, what is it in my life that you would want to change? What is it in my life that I'm doing and have been doing, but I should not be doing? What is it that I'm excusing or justifying? What attitudes are I, am I carrying in my heart or in my mind? How am I using my my thoughts in a way that's dis that are displeasing to you. We need to be willing to ask God to search our heart. If my people, which are called by my name, shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, 
then God says, will I hear from heaven and will forgive their sins and will heal their land. God is a merciful God, but he's also a just God. I'm not saying that what's happening all around us is because of any particular sin or even because of all sin. I'm just saying this ought to be a time. God says when you're, these things are happening in your world, let it be an occasion for you humbling yourselves and praying and seeking my face and turning from your wicked ways. I would like for us today just to sort of hit the pause button for a moment and turn to God with a true sense of humility, of desperation, not just for the medical or financial needs of our world, but because of the spiritual needs that surround us. And if God is using this time in your life and using His Word in your life to challenge you, to challenge you to draw close to Him, don't miss this. I'm thinking of a phrase I've used and heard repeated many times. Don't waste your sorrow. Use this time to turn to God Don't be guilty of saying, well, you know, we're going to pull out of this in a few weeks, then we'll all be, you know, back on course and we'll be back to normal. We don't don't really need the status quo. We need revival. We need for God to work. And may God use this time and use His Word and His Spirit working in our life to draw us closer to Him. And if you're not saved, use this time to think about your need for God. We need God in our lives. We need Him if we're going to go to heaven. Obviously, we need Him in our lives today. May God use this time in a very special way in our lives. Let's pray. Our Father, as we bow before You today, we thank You for these promises You gave to Your people. We thank You for the heart of Solomon as he cried out to You, concerning the dedication of this special place and the role that it would have and the prayers offered in this place the temple would have. We thank you for all these things. We thank you for the hope it gives us. Because, Lord, we know that we don't deserve your help, but we need you. God, I pray today that these days would find us all with a renewed sense of need and desperation and a renewed attitude of humility. These days would find us seeking your face and praying. We're guilty, Lord, of so many things, individually, collectively, And one of the things that we're all guilty of from time to time, and often I think it gets overlooked, is our pride. God, we want to humble ourselves and pray and seek your face and turn from our wicked ways, things that are not pleasing to you, that we tolerate, even embrace. God, we want to turn with an attitude of repentance Turn from our sin and turn to you. And trust you, Lord, that you will hear from heaven and forgive our sins and heal our land. Father, I truly pray that here in our little part of the world and around our country and around the world that your people would be crying out to you for your mercy for you to work for revival, for the Spirit of God to work in a great way. All for your honor and glory, and we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.